Hello everyone. We're continuing today with our series on of examining Latin American history through fiction or through literature. And today we're going to begin uh, perhaps my favorite book, 100 Years of Solitude. I'll just briefly introduce the book and then I'll give some uh, details of the historical context in Colombia during the time period of the book. And then uh, we'll go on from there. So let's get started. So the Colombia and 100 Years of Solitude by Gar Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Here's a picture of a typical Colombian village. Very colorful, very mountainous. And uh, here we go. So 100 Years of Solitude was written by Gabriel Garcia Mar Marquez, a uh, Colombian author. It was first published in Argentina in 1967, and uh, it was considered by the Chilean poet uh, Pablo Neruda to be the greatest revelation in the Spanish language since Don Quixote. Some pretty tall praise there. It's now been translated into over 35 languages. It has sold more than 30 million copies, and it was awarded uh, a French prize and also a Venezuelan uh, a prize for literature in 1969 and 1972. The novel tells two stories. It tells the story of a family over seven generations, approximately 100 years, and that of the village that they founded from its construction to its demise. Now there's a picture of Gabriel Garcia Marquez on the right and the cover from the latest edition of the book on the left. I think that's the one you're probably reading. So, Marquez, Garcia Marquez, uh, was the author that's most emblematic of the uh, boom period, excuse me, in the uh, Latin American literature from 1960 to about the early 1980s. Uh, the 100 Years of Solitude was his breakthrough novel published in 1967, and it was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1982. Uh, one French newspaper called Garcia Marquez, one of the greatest writers of the 20th century. Uh, he brought international renown to other authors as well from the Latin American boom, such as Jorge Luis Borges from Argentina, also Julio Cor Cortázar from Argentina, Argentina, and Mario Vargas Llosa from Peru, who we'll be talking about later in this course. Although he did not create magical realism, his novel, 100 Years of Solitude, is one of the greatest or not most notable examples of the genre. And here are some of the other authors of the Latin American boom, Julio Cortazar, Cortazar on the left, Garcia Marquez, Carlos Fuentes, and Mario Vargas Llosa. The Latin American boom in literature began around the 1960s with the rise of the genre called magical realism. It began with a wave of euphoria and optimism unleashed across Latin America by the Cuban Revolution in 1959. Uh, this was, uh, uh, do I want to comment here? Uh, you have to understand this euphoria and optimism over the Cuban Revolution. You have to understand the context of uh, Latin American history, of extreme social inequality, of uh, social repression by the elites against the uh, lower classes. This had been a cycle, as we've already talked about, from the beginning of the, from when the first Spaniards set foot on the Bahamas up through 1959. There had been a cycle of, uh, of war, guerra, poverty, inequality, oppression, foreign domination and exploitation. Uh, we've been looking at this through the lens of civilization versus barbarism from the beginning of our series. And uh, it's in this light that intellectuals and uh, lower class or working class people welcomed the uh, Cuban Revolution as uh, an op a, a chance to believe that they could change their societies. And uh, also the... Uh, chance to believe that they could become independent from the United States. 
from about the uh, middle of the 19th century, the United States had become more and more of a dominant force, uh, imperialistic dominant force in Mexico, in Central America, in the Caribbean, in, in some cases in South America. And so the fact that a tiny nation, uh, only 90 miles from the United States, could, uh, like a David, could stand up to Goliath and assert its own national sovereignty, uh, that was considered to be uh, an amazing feat by many uh, intellectuals in Latin America. Now, of course, this is before uh, the uh, Cuban Revolution develops more Soviet or more Marxist-Leninist overtones and before it begins to jail its dissidents, including poets and writers. And so some of the intellectuals uh, became disenchanted with the Cuban Revolution as it unfolded. Others stayed pretty faithful to it. Uh, Garcia Marquez is one of those that stayed very loyal to the Cuban Revolution and stayed, uh, remained as a close friend of Fidel Castro. Uh, that may be a strike against him, it, it, depending on your politics, but it's a uh, matter of historical record. Most frequently associated with the boom are those, the names of Julio Cortázar from Argentina, Carlos Fuentes from Mexico, Guillermo Cabrera Infante, whose uh, nation escapes me at the moment. Um, I'm not going to attempt to guess because I'll say it wrong. Gabriel Garcia Marquez of Colombia and Mario Vargas Llosa of Peru, who, again, we'll talk about him soon in this course. Two, we're two books away from that. Looks like uh, Guillermo Cabrera Infante was Cuban. There have been, uh, been pan... American literary movements before in Latin America, and we've discussed uh, one of those in the 19th century, which would be the uh, or national origin stories or foundational fictions, uh, national romances, uh, but not many. And there, let me move my face out of the way here, and there's a clear, there was a clear sense of new allegiances uh, in this uh, boom movement, not to individual countries, but to Latin America as a whole, to the Spanish language, to modern literature, to certain views of the relationship between the fiction, fiction and the world. Borges and Carpentier, Alejo Carpentier, who we've already read in uh, the, the Kingdom of This World, are both considered forerunners that predated the boom or magical realism. They weren't actually magical realists, but there were forerunners who experimented with some aspects of it. Uh, one author refers to them not as the fathers, but the uncles of magical realism. And in another lecture, we'll talk a little bit about, about that. So, the historical period for 100 years of solitude, we've, as we've come along, we've talked about the Historical periods in Argentina, in Brazil, in Venezuela, in Haiti, they're pretty clear-cut. But in the case of 100 Years of Solitude, it's much harder to specify a specific historical period for one reason, because it lasts, the story covers a 100-year period. And for another reason is Garcia Marquez does not anywhere use any precise dates in his book. So the best you can do is go through the book and look at specific historical events and try to correlate them in Colombian history. Um, there are a couple of those. The Thousand Days War, which is the uh, a major war that uh, uh, ripped Colombia from 1899 to 1902. Uh, undoubtedly, Aureliano Buendia was intended to, uh, his character fought in that war in this fictional book. Uh, so if you find in the book where they're talking about the Thousand Days War, you pretty much know it was between 1989 and 1902. There's also the uh, massacre of the banana workers in 1928, which was a historical event uh, carried out at, by the Colombian government at the behest of the United Fruit Company, and Garcia Marquez brings that in near the end of his book. So the question is, when did it begin? So that by inference, the founding of Macondo, which is the fictional town that this book takes place in, must have been around the time of Latin American independence or shortly thereafter. Latin American independence in Colombia was around 1820. 
and uh, the book is covers a hundred year period to some time shortly after the 1928 banana massacre. So let's put as a guess, let's put the beginning of the, the story and the beginning of Ma the founding of Macondo around 1828 or 1830, possibly. So here you see the founding of Macondo in the 1830s or 40s. Uh, then there's the Th War of a Thousand Days in the middle of the book, 1899-1902, and then the Banana Massacre, 1928. And of course, the, peer the book continues on for some time after the banana massacre. The the period of uh, the period of Latin American history that we derive from John Chastain's book, Born in Blood and Fire, would call the neo-colonial period would be from about 1880 through 1920. 1880 to 1920. So a lot of the significant events in this book. In the in the the heart of the book or the center of the book, towards the end, take place during the neo-colonial period. Um, neo-colonial simply means that it's a period of new colonialism. The old colonialism was when uh, Spain actually dominated these countries through the uh, monarchy, and they were considered colonies of Spain under vice regal administration. Neo-colonialism is a more indirect form of colonialism in which a country is dominated financially or economically and, of course, politically, follow the money, uh, but it's not officially a colony of the colonizing nation. That would be the example of the United States and Colombia. That would be neo-colonialism, not direct old-fashioned colonialism. So the elites in a neo-colonial system collaborate with foreign explo exploiters or foreign investors and oppress their own people uh, in order to enrich themselves with the uh, foreign power. That's neocolonialism. Rather than functioning on behalf of the nation from a nationalist perspective. So, let's say a word about the founding of Macondo. Macondo is the fictional town that this uh, whole story takes place. Um... I put some, an example of some magical realist art up there in the left corner of what, I mean, the book does not talk about volcanoes, so this is not Macondo. However, it has, it is considered to be magical realist art. Uh, at the time that Macondo was a village of 20 adobe houses built on the bank of a river of clear water that ran along a bed of polished stones. This is a quote from the book which were white and enormous like prehistoric eggs. The world was so recent that many things lacked names. This is a cue that this is early in Colombian history. The world was so recent that many things lacked names, and in order to indicate them, it was necessary to point. This is Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude, um, page 7 in the 1967 edition. A second reason that for the difficulty of fixing specific dates is that the book covers seven generations of one family, the Buendia family in the fictional town of Macondo. Basically, it covers nearly all of Colombia's modern history from independence up through the beginning of La Violencia in the middle of the 20th century. La Violencia began, most people consider, to begin around 1944, with the assassination of Jorge Elisier Gaitan. Uh, he was a lawyer, Colombian lawyer, a mestizo, a populist, who was looking into the, uh, investigating the 1928 uh, banana massacre, which is what brought him to public fame. And in 1944, as he was running for president of Colombia, he was assassinated in downtown Bogota, leading to three or four days of riots, uh, called, that were called the Bogotazo. Uh, the whole city was on fire and uh, rioting. A sm uh, interesting tidbit of uh, factual history. It turns out that Fidel Castro was in the city during the Bog uh, Bogotazo. He was a college student, there for an international congress of students. Who knows? I've never seen anything written about what he may or may not have done during the uh, rioting, but he was there. 
And so in 1944, this Bogotazo begins. Civil order begins to break down in Colombia. Uh, something called the La Violencia begins, which is sort of a civil war, but it gets far worse than a civil war because both parties basically degenerate into revenge, uh, set, settling scores. Uh, the, the, the violence was a, basically a complete breakdown of Colombian society in which you had uh, one village fighting the next village. You had liberals fighting Colombian uh, conservatives. You had Catholics fighting Protestants. And it went on for about 10 years of complete civil disorder. 200,000 people died. And basically the book, uh, the book 100 Years of Solitude, comes to an end around the beginning of that complete uh, breakdown of civil society. Here's an example of the uh, Buendia family tree. Here's not an example, but a schematic. So we start out the book with the two parents who are uh, migrants, internal migrants. They're leading a group of other young couples to a new place to settle. They find this place alongside a river. They decide to call it Macondo, and they build their first buildings there. They're led by Jose Arcadio Buendia and Ursula Iguararan. I'm not pronouncing that right. Igual... Iguararan, Ursula Iguararan, and they have several children. Uh, they have uh, two sons, Jose Arcadio and Aureliano, who's going to become a, a major significant character throughout the book. And then they adopt, uh, no, they, then they have another daughter named Amaranta. I think they adopt Rebecca, who marries Jose Arcadio. And you see uh, first, second generation, then there's the third generation and they have a tendency every generation to name their sons and grandsons and great-grandsons by the same name uh, as the original two. Arcadio, uh, various variations. Arcadio, Aureliano Jose, uh, Jose Arcadio II, Aureliano II, uh, Amaranta Ursula, Jose Arcadio again, and Are Aureliano Babylonia. And finally, the last one is Aureliano. And so uh, it, this can lead to a little bit of confusion, trying to keep the characters uh, separate and understand which character is doing which. Um, so we we basically said that the 100 years begins shortly after Latin American independence. It goes up to nearly the middle of the 20th century with the social breakdown that comes with the La Violencia. However, we could extend it a little further back because in the early part of the book, there's some references uh, to uh, Sir Francis Drake and the uh, 1500s. Uh, although the book doesn't take place, the story doesn't take place during that time period, it looks back to 1569 when Sir Francis Drake attacked a coastal city of Colombia called Rio Acha. That's actually true history. And the, and the book recalls that. And it mentions that the great-grandparents of Jose Arcadio and Ursula uh, lived during that time and experienced that conflict along the coast of Colombia with the dread pirate Drake. I had an uh, instructor in college who was from Spain, and she said parents used to put their kids down at night uh, and tell them to be good and go to sleep or... El Drake would come to get them. So, just to, in Spain, even up into the 20th century, El Drake, or St. Francis Drake, was a, a name of terror and a boogeyman and a very bad guy. Of course, in England, he's a good guy. Uh, so that was 1569 that he uh, sailed along the Colombian coast and attacked several cities. So, uh, let me see if I... This is a picture of his route in the mid-1560s, where he he sailed down along the coast of Africa, past Spain, and then across to the uh, northern coast of Venezuela, and then along the coast of Colombia, after a stop in uh, Cuba and Hispaniola, then up through the Caribbean and along the coast of Florida and the southern United States and back to England. Uh, so that's another historical marker we can use to fix the book. The, the story in the book did not take place, but it harkens back to the 1500s and the founding of Latin America. Um, so what can we say here? 
Um, Garcia Marquez wrote the book in 1967, uh, near the in the second half of the 20th century. But in his book, not only does he go back to the independence period, but then he harkens further back to the uh, Spanish conquest and colonization. So that makes one suspect or wonder if uh, with this book, if Garcia Marquez is trying to make a statement about the entire history of Latin America from the from the time of the conquest up through con the contemporary period when he wrote the book. That's something to think about as you read the book. Is there a message in this book, not only about Colombia, but about the entire span of history of Latin America? Here's a couple more uh, pictures that are done in the magic realist style. The one in the upper left is El Nuevo Mundo by Liliana Golibinsky. And the uh, on the right is a Magical Realism 2A by Federico Fuentes of Ecuador. Uh, one of the big deals that happens in, in the story, 100 Years of Solitude, is when the train is built and comes through, the train comes through Macondo. It basically connects it with the outside world. And, of course, makes possible the, the ma mass production of bananas and their export. Uh, another thing about Colombian history that we should note is regional isolation. Colombia's various regions were extremely isolated in the early 19th century because of three mountain chains that divided the country in the swampy lowlands near the mouth of the Magdalena River. Communication between the various regions of Colombia were practically non-existent. Here's a picture of the three mountain chains. Bogota is located in the uh, pl in a plain at near the top of the uh, of the third mountain chain, the furthest one on the right. And Medellin is between the the other two on the left. And of course, our story takes place at the extreme north end of Colombia, on the coast the, the coastal setting. So uh, I've heard it said, I've read somewhere that uh, in the uh, colonial period, someone could write a letter to, uh, from Bogota, send it to Great Britain, and get a reply back before they could do the same thing from Bogota to Medellin. Uh, Medellin is the second largest city in the company in the country. It's the capital of Antioquia. Um, I've I've traveled myself from Bogota to Medellin and back by bus, and and by plane. And it's about a seven or eight hour trip on a bus. But in the colonial period, in the early 19th century, before railroads were existed, the only way to get from, the only practical way to get from Bogota to Medellin was to travel down the river, the Magdalena River, and then back up a different river to get to uh, Medellin. It was a very lengthy and arduous process. This led to an extreme level of regionalism in Colombian history. If I just recently re-watched re the uh, Colombian series Narcos, Netflix series. It's actually quite historical, which is why I enjoy it. But you can hear a very distinctly different accents from the Bogotano, uh, Bogotano characters, from the Medellin Paisa characters, and the Cali characters. They all developed a very different dialects of Spanish because they were so isolated. And they were so isolated that Colombia became the first nation in the Western Hemisphere to develop a national airline service called Avianca. Uh, Avianca was founded in 1919 and is the oldest airline in the Americas. The second oldest airline is, uh, is uh, I think, Pan American, uh, which was founded in the 1930s in the United States. Uh, and also, Avianca was the second oldest airline in the world. So in this area, Colombia was way ahead in air, air travel. And that was simply because it was nearly impossible to travel across Colombia by by car or by truck, by land. And so the simplest, most practical way to get around Colombia in 1919 was to fly an airplane. Here's a picture of Anvianca. Uh This is a picture of the uh, the upper right, I mean, sorry, the lower right, you see Araca, I don't know how it's pronounced, Aracataca or Aracataca. I don't see a tilde, so it should be Aracataca. 
was that was the birthplace of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, where he actually grew up. It was in a small town near the coast of Colombia called Aracataca. And you, you can see it's not far from Santa Marta or Barranquilla on the coast, or Cartagena. And then you see Rio Acha over on the uh, upper left, upper right, I'm sorry, on the coast. That's the town that is referenced to in the book as being attacked by Sir Francis Drake in 1569. Over in the upper left, you see the fictional location. Uh, just, just by going by the descriptions of mountains and swamps, Macondo is basically, if, uh, by drawing an imaginative map and relating it to Rio Acha and the, and the uh, Caribbean Ocean, you can see that Macondo is basically located about where Aracataca was located, uh, Garcia Marquez's actual birthplace. And in the middle picture there, you see where this whole region takes place at the extreme uh, north corner of Colombia, an area that uh, borders along with uh, Venezuela. I've actually already spoken about neocolonialism. Um, most of the important events in, in this book take place during the neocolonial period around 1880 through 1820. I'm sorry, 1920. I Please correct that. 1880 through 1920. At least correct it in your minds. I don't know if I... I don't think I can correct it right now. So uh, I'm not going to go back over that, but that was a period of time of extreme transformation in Latin America. You had, instead of little villages in the mountains with their colonial cobblestones and white plaster walls, red tiled roofs, uh, major Latin American cities, or especially in Colombia, they became modern metropolises comparable to urban giants anywhere. Bogota exploded, Medellin grew. Streetcars swayed, telephones jangled, silent movies flickered from Montevideo to Santiago to Mexico City and Havana. Railroads multiplied miraculously, as did exported tons of sugar, coffee, copper, grain, nitrate, tin, cacao, rubber, bananas, beef, wool, and tobacco. That's a long list there of uh, primary source um, of exports, natural, natural, uh, natural pro products and exports from Latin America. Natural resources, I was trying to say. Despite these many transformations, um, Latin America's subordinate relationship to developed countries like the United States. Angie, can you shut that door, please? Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, so Latin America continued to be subordinate. In the early part of the 19th century, it was subordinate to European countries, Great Britain, France, uh, and trade, especially with Great Britain, but in the 19th century, the U.S. emerged as a dominant country, and Latin America became more and more subordinate economically to exports to the United States. And uh, also, so that didn't change, uh, despite all the other changes. Also, another thing that did not change was the rigid social hierarchy created by colonization that we've talked about from the beginning of this course. The, uh, you know, the of course, the Peninsulares left after the uh, Wars of Independence with Spain. The Creoles assumed the top position in the social hierarchy. Reviewing my definition, Creoles are white European Europeans born in the Americas. So their birthplace is Colombia, but uh, by their background, their wealth probably, their skin tone, all are European-oriented. Those are the Creoles, and under the Creoles came Mestizos, who were a mixture. And then under the under the Mestizos, or the Mulattoes, came uh, indigenous peoples and African slaves. And by this time, increasingly freed, freed uh, blacks, who were no longer enslaved, but they were still uh, predominantly looked at Africa as their heritage. Uh, Afro-Latinos, if you will. So these two things did not change. The sub subordinate economic relationship did not change, and the social hierarchy did not change. The 
hierarchical relations of ca race and class in which those at the top derive decisive prestige and advantage from their outside connections remain the norm. That's why it's called neocolonialism, because the elites basically, to put it somewhat bluntly, sell out the working and popular classes of their country in order to line their pockets and to be uh, rewarded by foreign investors or importers from the United States and Great Britain and elsewhere. That's neocolonial. The Colombian historical context, Colombia has a long tradition of democracy, but it's a oligarchic democracy, a democracy of the upper classes. Uh, so the democracy in Colombia was a rival between, uh, was a contest or a constant warfare between two rival oligarchies. Uh, I think that, and I shouldn't comment on politics, but you know that, I think a lot of people feel that that's increasingly true in the United States, that both classical political parties uh, represent corporate interests and the oligarchy. And that's why you see some of the beginnings of populism at the base in the United States. Uh, populism has been around for a long time in Latin America because it comes from that sense of disconnection with the elites who are uh, operating out of their own self-interest instead of the interests of the nation. Liberals and conservatives dominated the 19th century and most of the 20th century politics stood for quite different things. Uh, reform or reaction, liberals were for reform. Free trade or protection, liberals were for free trade, conservatives for protection. Separation or conjunction of the church and state, liberals were anti-clerical. They wanted uh, separation of church and state. Conservatives were pro-Catholic. They wanted the, uh, the, the nation to be a Catholic nation. Um, and the jokes about the sameness in the 100 years of solitude are extravagance or hyperboles. In other words, there's a lot in 100 years that talks about there being no difference between the liberals and conservatives. Actually, there were differences, but they both were first and foremost about their own elite self-interest. Colombia experienced at least five significant civil wars in the 19th century. It's not including the 20th century with the La Violencia and then a the long-running uh, narco war and guerrilla warfare that's actually still going on. Uh, all of these five civil wars uh, were between the conservative and the liberal parties. Liberals generally stood for federalism, laissez-faire free market principles, anti-clericalism, while the conservatives leaned, to, leaned towards uh, centralism, tradition, and supported a strong role for the Catholic Church. Now, this is a flip of uh, Argentina. In this area of centralism, it was more the liberals or the unitarios in Argentina who favored centralism, and it was the conservative rural folk rustics that favored federalism. In Colombia, it was the reverse. The conservatives wanted a central government, and the liberals wanted to keep it federalist. They wanted to have more power to the various provinces. Uh, the constant civil war between the conservatives and the liberals in Colombian history may have contributed to the description of uh, Colonel Aureliano Buendia as having started 32 uprisings and lost them all. Uh, it, it kind of gives a feeling of political despair. Repeatedly throughout the book, Aureliano Buendia is described as having started 32 uprisings and lost them all. And... Uh, that's probably, I'm, a, I'm sure that's an exaggeration. However, the, the actual historical character that apparently Aureliano Buendia is based on did participate in a number of uprisings and fought in three civil wars. I'll get to him in a minute. And lost all three of them. The War of a Thousand Days began in 1899, lasted to the end of 1902. It was the fifth major civil war in Colombian history and was particularly devastating. For one thing, it more or less directly led, or at least indirectly led, to the loss of the Panama Canal to the United States as a separated uh, national state and the building of the Panama Canal. Colombia was weakened in 1902 and unable to hold on to Panama. It was once again a fight between centralism and federalism. Uh, in this case, the centralism won. After this war was over, there was never any further discussion 
on this issue. Colombia became a unitary state, which is it is, it is still today. The various uh, areas, regions of Colombia are not called states; they're called provinces. And the governor, when the, there's a new presidential election, the new president appoints the governors in each province. They're not elected, so it's a unitary state, centralist. Um, the conservatives won the victory, and this gave them dominance of the organs of state in Colombia for another 28 years. So until 1930, it was until 1930 until a liberal president was finally uh, elected in Colombia. Somewhere near the, towards the end of our novel. Colombia's political structure as a, as a unitary state has not been challenged. With an estimated 100,000 to 150,000 fatalities, the 2.5% of the nation's population at that time uh, this was the conflict was the deadliest conflict and the most destructive war up to this point in the history of Colombia. Not quite as deadly or destructive as the Mexican Revolution, which we uh, have already talked about, I believe. So here are some of the child soldiers in the War of a Thousand Days in 1900. Rafael Uribe Uribe is a, an important historical figure in Colombian history. In an interview, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez said that he had based the character of Aureliano Buendia loosely upon the figure of uh, the historical, factual figure of Rafael Uribe Uribe. I have a friend at the university in the Spanish department from Colombia who says that Rafael Uribe Uribe was her great-grandfather. So Uribe Uribe was from Antioquia, which is the... Uh, province where Medellin is located, the second largest city of Colombia, uh, and it, he participated in three civil wars as a very young man in 1876, then again in 1885 and 1895, I'm sorry, it's four civil wars. Out of the five civil wars in Colombia, he was in four of them. And then finally in 1899, in the uprising that led to the War of a Thousand Days. So this is where perhaps Garcia Marquez gets this kind of exaggerates with hyperbole and says that Aureliano started 32 uprisings and lost them all. Uh, and he lost, he was on the losing side in all four of these wars. He was a lawyer and became a professor in constitutional law and political economy. He died on October 15, 1914, after he was attacked with axes the day before by two workers. Uh, in an interview, Garcia Marquez says that Aureli Ano Buendia was loosely based on this figure. So not only, he, not only did he live a very tumultuous life, but he died uh, kind of violently with, uh, with two people attacking him with axes. That makes him sort of an Aureliano type magical realist figure. The 1928 Banana Massacre uh, was another historical event that's very important in Colombian history. Uh, it took place in the town of See, I can't pronounce that. Two strong vowels next to each other. Cienaga? Cienaga. Cienaga. In English, you never have two strong vowels together without a consonant separating them. So those uh, double vowels are hard for Americans to pronounce. Cienaga. Near Santa Marta. So this was not far from the fictional town of Macondo or... Garcia Marquez is the actual birth town and hometown of uh, Arac Aracataca. And so this uh, was this massacre took the lives of workers, Colombian workers who worked for the United Fruit Company and occurred between December 5th and 6th in 1928. The strike began when the workers ceased to work until the company could reach an agreement with them to grant them dignified working conditions. The United Fruit Company is a bad actor. I'm sorry, I, I have to give my opinion here. Uh, we're not going to talk about Guatemala in this course, but they also overthrew a legitimately elected government in 1953 in Guatemala. The, uh, the head of the CIA, John Foster Dulles, and his brother uh, was the Secretary of State and his bro brother, Alan Dulles, was the head of the CIA 
They were also shareholders and board members on the board of the United Fruit Company. And so they uh, engineered behind the scenes a regime change operation that successfully overthrew one of the better presidents and a democratically elect elected president of Guatemala. And so uh, they've been bad actors throughout Central America, Colombia, and the Caribbean, in my opinion, my humble opinion. Um, so when the strike could not be resolved, the United Fruit Company refused to negotiate. And after a standoff of several weeks, the U.S. government put pressure on the conservative government of Colombia to send in the Colombian army. They set up uh, machine guns on the top of buildings. And they uh, began to mow down a, a, a large uh, peaceful protest of demonstrators. Uh, there's conflicting results. No one knows to this day how many people died. Estimates go up to 2,000. Um, but there were telegrams in the historical archives sent from the U.S. Embassy to Bogota, from Bogota to Washington, and it, these were uh, these telegrams had no reason to lie or to. Uh, they were they were pro-American from the U.S. Embassy, and they admitted there were 500 to 1,000 dead in the early counting. So there was obviously probably a lot more people dead than the Colombian government was willing to admit, and the United Fruit Company had blood on its hands. Con Congressman Jorge Alicier Gaitan was a <coughs> populist, mestizo politician, claimed that the bodies were thrown into the sea. And I think there's a reference to that in the book. The Aureliano, who happened to be present at that massacre, uh, became obsessed with trying to find out what happened to all the people and how they covered it up. Uh, the end result is that the truth will never be known. Guerrilla movements within Colombia, such as FARC, have called the Colum Colombian government actions in the Banana Massacre state terrorism. So that's another historical anchor in terms of the, the storyline in the book. And we come, and I've already talked about 1948. I said 44, but it looks like it's 1948. I apologize. Populist leader Jorge Elisier Gaitan was assassinated and sparked a three-day riot, and this basically degenerated into a, a complete social collapse and, and chaos and, and random violence. And, uh, that went on for 10 years. It got so bad that the uh, elites of both parties, the conservatives and the liberals, realized that it was a it was a war of attrition that was going that no one could win, that they were all going to lose. And so, in 1956, they uh, they uh, came together. The conservative and liberal elites came together and decided to create a unified government called El Frente Nacional, the National Front, and that every, uh, I believe it was six-year terms, every six years, uh, only liberals would run for the pres office of president, and uh, the two liberals would run against each other, and one of them would win, and the conservatives would support that candidate, and then they would alternate in six years, and uh, it would only be two conservatives running for the post of president, and the liberals would support the winner of that contest. And so, from 1956 up to my first trip to Colombia in 1985, uh, this national front was, was going on, in which liberals and conservatives did not run against each other. They only ran within their own parties, and they alternated the uh, control of the state. Uh, so that means it was, still was an oligarchic democracy. There was still no room for the popular classes to have an, a voice of expression in this kind of a structure. Which then that led to uh, the FARC, the Frente Nacional de Colombia, uh, Frente de Acción, I, I might not be getting the name right, but it's called the FARC, F-A-R-C. Uh, I'll look it up later. But uh, they're still active. Uh, Recently, there have been negotiations to try to disarm and allow them to enter the political process, but the FARC was a was a Marxist group that uh, basically came out of the La Violencia, and they were uh, more radical or progressive liberals that never accepted the Frente Nacional, so they continued uh, 
continued in their own uh, regional areas where they were relatively safe with their own republics and uh, basically not acknowledging the authority of the central state. And uh, they basically continued a civil war from the La Violencia ended in 1956 and the civil war began up until, what's it, 2020? Uh, at one time, Colombia and Guatemala were competing for the longest civil war in, in the world, and uh, Colum uh, Guatemala finally made peace after 40 years. Colombia's civil war is still going on, although it's been reduced. And it eventually morphed into a narco-trafficking war. So, basically, war has been the, the, the uh, um, status quo in Colombia for most of two centuries. So... This leads to a sense of political despair. And this is a characteristic, although I said that the boom began with a sense of euphoria and optimism with the Cuban Revolution, it quickly morphed into a sense of cynicism and despair as the Cuban Revolution appeared to go off the rails and uh, as government after government reacted with repression against their own people, which we'll be talking about in a couple of weeks. Uh, the repression, the dirty wars in Argentina and Brazil and Chile, Uruguay, the uh, severe political repression against leftists. This leaves a, a kind of an atmosphere of disp political despair in magical realist works. And you'll pick up on that in 100 Years of Solitude. So, um, the characters, I believe we'll say this maybe for the next time, but uh, just, just to know that the Jose Arcadios are brash, impulsive, and lusty. The Aurelianos are reclusive, lucid, and solitary. If you read the story of, uh, read the Wikipedia entry of Rafael Oribe Oribe, he was a shy child. He fit the Aureliano's character. The women, like Ursula, are either strong and waspish, or like Remedios, frail and sensuous. And so this describes the three generations. Uh, you know, who, who they are, who their children were. And I'm not going to go through it. Maybe we'll come back to this in the next lecture. This this book is obviously too big to cover in one lecture.